Hi there everyone, welcome to this week's video where we're going to be discussing Hayward on the ethics of climate change. Now you might have noticed that we're now two thirds of the way through our course, which means that we're running into our last section that I've entitled Moral Problems. Now you might be wondering, what's the difference between a moral problem and a moral debate as we've structured it? Well, the way that I think about it is like this. Moral debates tend to coalesce around a yes or no question. So we saw Kant and Fichte, for example, disagree about the permissibility of the death penalty. We saw them disagree about the permissibility of lying under certain kinds of circumstances. And we saw in our other cases, for example, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Socrates of the Crido disagreeing about the issue of civil disobedience. This tends to be how we often think about moral problems, is that there's an obvious, uh, you know, pro or con, yes or no element to it. But in our last section of the syllabus, I want us to consider what I call moral problems. And I'll call these just moral dilemmas where there's not an obvious uh, solution. There's no clear way that we could think about just a simple yes or no uh, kind of answer. And I think that the ethics of climate change is a perfect example for this problem. Now, sometimes uh, climate change and the issues surrounding climate change and global warming are presented in a kind of debate format. We've seen this, if you've lived in the United States and been politically aware over the last 20 years, in debates between Democrats and Republicans, where Republicans would argue either that climate change is not real or that climate change is real but not anthropogenic or argue that climate change is real and anthropogenic, but ultimately harmless. For the most part, climate scientists and moral philosophers have arrived at a consensus view, which is that these claims are false. The planet is warming at startling and alarming rates that is already producing a significant damage to ecosystems across the globe. It is the <clears throat> excuse me, it is anthropogenic or caused by human beings because it is linked to our use of carbon and specifically our carbon emissions. And moreover, uh, sometimes Republicans will claim that, uh, you know, planets change temperatures and that's a normal thing uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, we have significant reason to believe that climate change is already damaging ecosystems across the globe. So in general, moral philosophers are not going to entertain arguments of this sort. Uh, the reality is just that climate change is real and it is extremely damaging and it is caused by human practices. And that's a huge moral problem that we now have to consider. Because we have to acknowledge, as Hayward points out, that humanity is not a giant person, right? It's not like humanity itself like decides to do stuff like in the way that you and I decide to do things. Instead, when we talk about humanity, we're talking about an incredibly complex amalgamation of all the human actors everywhere on earth. Therefore, there's a really difficult question how do we coordinate our behavior so as to best stave off the effects of climate change or to prevent further warming of the planet? Who is responsible for uh, you know, it, ensuring that we take these responsibilities and so on? What are the scope of our initiatives to prevent global warming and uh, climate disaster? This is the question that we're going to be investigating for today's video. Now in the left column here, I have um, some rights, uh, specifically rights that will tend to be brought up as uh, issues in these debates. So, sorry, I'm having issues with the camera. Hopefully it's fixed. Okay, uh, in general, 
Hayward brings up two kinds of considerations that are brought forward when we start thinking about the ethics of climate change. And the first question is, do we have a right to pollute? Some companies, oil companies, for example, will oftentimes claim that it is a human right uh, for them to be able to pursue, uh, you know, their business and um, uh, consequently environmental regulations actually harm them and undermine their rights. You might think about them as arguing something like this. I have the right to the pursuit of happiness. I need to, uh, you know, frack or extract oil in some capacity in order to pursue my happiness. Therefore, just in so far as I have a right to the pursuit of happiness, I have the right um, to my means of pursuing happiness, right? Which in this case would be, uh, you know, maybe oil and gas or something like that, right? Well, the problem that Hayward points out with this argument and the reason why most ethicists uh, conclude that there's not something like a right to, produce, to pollute is because while you do have a right to the pursuit of happiness, you don't have the right to any means towards that happiness that you would like. So for example, I have the right to the pursuit of happiness, but I don't have the right to, you know, say mug someone, right, in order to pursue my own happiness. So therefore, insofar as <clears throat> excuse me, insofar as any sort of climate activist demonstrates that there's a significant harm that comes from carbon emissions or pollution, then they can in turn demonstrate, uh, you know, that there is no right to pollute, right? So in general, Hayward concludes that most uh, uh, ethicists do not believe that there's such a thing as, for example, a right to pollute. So you might then ask, well, is there a corresponding right, right? If there's not a right to pollute, is there a right not to be harmed by climate change? And in general, uh, Hayward is going to say that for the most part, the consensus on this issue is yes, people do generally have a right not to be harmed. And uh, that right not to be harmed would extend naturally to kinds of harms that are caused by climate change, such as uh, you know, um, biodiversity collapse and so on. But the question, the burning question, the thing that makes the ethics and morality of climate change so difficult is that it's very, very obvious that climate change is going to hurt people, that it is a significant moral wrong. But it is extremely hard to figure out a theory of who ought to be responsible and what actions they ought to take in response to climate change. So in a way, it's fine and dandy for us to talk about a right not to be harmed by changes to the climate, but that requires us to substantiate in turn who it is that is going to enforce this right. Who is it that is going to make sure that this right is substantial, right? Enforceable, legally binding. Rights are only meaningful on the condition that someone has a responsibility in turn. So my own right to my life means that there's a responsibility on everyone around me to respect that right and not to needlessly, wantonly endanger my life. Now, in these cases, it's easy to say who is responsible for protecting my rights because the person responsible for protecting my rights is the state, right? The federal government is uh, responsible for protecting my rights and they have, uh, you know, distributed that right also to the state governments and so on, right? But who, what agency, what political body is going to provide enforcement for this kind of right and on what basis, right? What principles underlie their judgments? 
So in other words, uh, there's more or less a consensus. There's not a right to pollute. There is a right not to be harmed. But to substantiate what it means to have a right not to be harmed, then we need to outline the responsibilities that individual agents or actors or states or whoever uh, are going to act on in turn. And that is where the real difficulty is. That's where a lot of substantial disagreement uh, enters, right? Because we have to do something. Uh, everyone agrees about that. But the range of options is far more complicated than any sort of binary yes, no kind of framework. So let's get into the thicket of it now by talking about the uh, right column of the board, responsibilities. <clears throat> Here, I've just brought out um, a few different kinds of paradigms that Hayward discusses in their piece to think about how, you know, in the real world, we've really thought about distributing uh, responsibility for climate change. So the Kyoto Protocol is uh, an international agreement, and it's often sort of like the standard uh, by which we uh, sort of judge uh, issues in environmental ethics, right? Because it's the most wide-ranging international political agreement uh, concerning emission reduction uh, that we have, right? And essentially, uh, how Hayward outlines the Kyoto Protocol is that everyone aims to reduce their levels from 1990 by 5% within a given time span. So countries that are really big polluters, like the United States, for example, uh, uh, can continue to polluting at, uh, continue polluting at a rate uh, that is much higher uh, than peer nations as long as they meet this minimal criteria of reducing their amount of emissions by comparison to their 1990 standards. Contrast this position with a country like India, right, which has had an exploding population over the past few decades, right? Is it really realistic in a way to hold, uh, you know, India in the 2020s to the emission standards of India in the 1990s? Is that really the same thing or as fair as holding the United States to 5% lower than the emission standard in 1990, right? So the Kyoto Protocol has come under criticism from various groups, organizations, activists, people who claim that it unfairly distributes the responsibilities for climate change and massively advantages nations such as the United States uh, that were high polluters in the 1990s and provides, you know, kind of backwards incentive structure for ultimately be, being able to stop runaway climate change. Most climate scientists, as I understand it, believe that the Kyoto Protocol on its own will not be enough. But at the same time, it speaks to uh, the pragmatic viability of the Kyoto Protocol. So it is, you know, the standard for environmental uh, uh, agreements of this sort. Two other models that you might think about in order to distribute the responsibility for uh, climate change are what Hayward calls the causal model and the beneficiary pays model. The causal model argues that the biggest emitters should cut the most. So unlike the United States, uh, you know, sort of having this outsized advantage on the Kyoto Protocol model, this model calls for the United States and other high polluter countries uh, to be the biggest, uh, you know, uh, nations to uh, cut their emissions and contribute to climate reversal. Similarly, uh, on the beneficiary model, those who benefited the most from emissions uh, should pay. And then finally, there's the ability model, which is just that those who can should cut emissions, right? But that doesn't really seem like a theory of 
political responsibility. That seems like a way of giving up uh, on holding anyone responsible and accepting uh, what comes. So the big question that I think is revealed by all of these different approaches is that the fundamental question here is like, who pays what? Who is going to be obligated or uh, responsible for enforcing these rights? Should, you know, the primary agents when we're thinking about such matters be international institutions uh, like the IPCC or the UN? Should we be thinking at the level of nation states? How stable is that given that, for example, in the United States, political parties change every four to eight years, right? Um, so how can you have these uh, long-term uh, commitments in the form of treaties when nations are politically fickle? Do we need to rely on corporations, organizations of that scale? If so, uh, you know, our current situation should not really give us much confidence in that as a solution. Although some people do believe that there will be purely technological solutions to climate change. Most climate scientists disagree with that perspective. Or is it really all up to us as the individual agents? Are we the ones who are responsible for climate change? The average American consumes far more electricity uh, and pollu ends up, you know, being a contrib contributor to pollution far more than, uh, you know, residents of other nations. Does that mean that we are especially responsible? Are there things that we should commit to or do in our lives, like? reduce or cut international travel, reduce or cut our beef consumption, reduce or cut our own uh, 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 pollution levels, whether that's through our you know, choice of travel and so on. What should we do? I think that this is the big burning question of the 21st century. And ethicists will continue thinking about it and disagreeing with one another. But what I'm most interested in is hearing your opinion. What do you think? Who should be responsible for uh, preventing climate change? And what actions do you think are they obligated to do? I look forward to hearing what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.